All right. Well, happy Wednesday. So we got not too much more today. We're going to finish talking about loops. And then I did want to talk about the lab. A couple people got stuck. Uh, hey, guys, 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 if you're going to have conversations, you can go out in the hall. All right. So uh, a couple of people have got a little stuck on some of the shapes here. I think part one, everyone was um, like the squares and rectangles. I think everyone was fine on that, right? Okay. It's just the, those other shapes. So um, I did get some of that started. So we looked at like doing the top half of the diamond, right? And then I think I finished out the bottom half of the diamond. We didn't do any of the prompts. So um, I put that in my lab repo. Where did that one go? Goodness, I can find it. I think I put it in the wrong one. So that's, I just didn't want to make another repository. Give me one second. Let me find it here. Yeah, okay. So I started it for lab one here. These ones are private, so I need to move the code over to the public repo for you guys. But um, the sort of idea that we would do, that, that's a little small. Is that a little better? Right, start our size, right? And again, ask the user, not, not just give them this value, this hard code. This is just for a quick example, right? And then we're doing the top part, and then we do the bottom half with the diamond. And then we can keep all of it in sort of some, some loop for what did they want to do? I like constant ints. Characters are great. Strings are great too. Strings are a little trickier because you have to deal with the casing. Um, any any sort of menu is going to work, right? It's not not the end of the world. Um, so I'll get the job done. Just tell the person what you want to do there. Um, so this one's the diamond's basically done. Did you want to see one of the other shapes or like the right triangle? No, just. Pick one, whichever one you wanted to do was fine. Yeah, because you, you can have it line up where it's the easy way, you don't have to deal with spaces, or the one where you have to space all the, the diamonds out. Um, so either one either one will work. Um, if you wanted to give them options, that's fun too. But here, So I'm going to show you, if you do the console app here, that other junk you get, I'll show you real quick. It's not, not the end of the world here. Let's call this one Lab 1. Um, but it gives us more than we need, which sometimes can be distracting and a little confusing. We've done a couple projects now, so I think we'll be okay, like... Hey, I've got a bunch of other stuff in here. It's got the standard, the STD piece here already. We didn't do the include, but it's nice that it gives you that file already ready to go, right? So doing that, pretty nice and easy, right? Uh, it, going, going through the hard way a couple times is very useful. And that way, if you get to a project and you need to add more, add more files, you know where to go. So I'm sorry I didn't show you the quick way first, right? But and then you got to like get rid of all these comments because they're just obnoxious. Like, who, who wants all those? So um, not too bad. So if you want to use that starting template, it works pretty well, right? Instead of having to make the, all your files yourself and then you're in pretty good shape. And it, it, so it gives you backslash ends. Um, I've heard this end line is supposed to be better anyway. So I don't know. Not too big of a deal. Um, backslash n works great in Windows, but like... In Unix or Linux, you need the backslash and, and the backslash R or some nonsense. I don't know. It's, it's weird because we use different returns. There's carriage returns and there's new lines, and sometimes you need both. And, like, end line just does the right thing, which is nice. All right, so we've got this. So if we wanted to do the right triangle, right, we could have some number of size or height or whatever we wanted to call it here. So I'll just say size is 9, right? And then we're going to loop, and we're going to loop inside of a loop. Right? So we're going to loop for every row, right, for every line. So we can say for... And then we give it the three things, right? We're going to start a new variable. In row is zero. Row is less than size. Uh, if I can get the right keys here. And row plus plus. And then what do we want to do inside of this loop? Well, inside of this loop, now I need to print out the right number of stars based on the row that I'm on. So I'm going to do another loop. So for int column is zero. Uh, and then column. Now we want column to be less than or equal to row. A couple different ways we could handle this. Um, this way, I think, makes the most sense in my head. So when row is zero, I want one star. When row is one, I want two stars. Ugh, that's kind of gross. So what if we say row is one and less than or equal to size? And then we can start column at zero and go less than row, or we can start column at one and go less than or equal to row. So any, any way that's going to get the job done. So the first row, you want one star. The next row, you want two stars. The next row, you want three stars. Right? We just keep adding one star every time. So whichever way this makes sense to do for you, it'll, it'll work, right? We just want to make sure that, so here, if it's row one, I want one star because one is less than or equal to one, right? 
this, this will give me one star as we go. So I can see out a single star. And then at the end of, the, at the end of all the columns, then, I'm going to see out the end line right, to go down to the next line. So when row starts as one, then this loop will run. This loop runs as, okay, column starts as one. Is one less than or equal to one? Oops, column plus plus. Yes, it is. So it prints one star. Then column goes up to two. Two is not less than one. This loop stops, and then we print out an end line. We came back up here. Row was one. Now row plus plus row is two. Is two less than size? Yes. Okay. Now row starts at two. So column is one. Is one less than two? Yes. Print a star. All right. Two. Is two less than or equal to two? Yes. Print a second star. We get two stars. So you can kind of see it. It'll build out for every, whatever row it's on. It'll put that many stars. It'll give us that nice right angle triangle shape. Right? And we don't have to deal with the spaces. Um, if you search online, you can get some weird looking garbage that doesn't awesome call it rows and columns. And uh, people love I and J here and it drives me completely nuts. And I, I hate when people do that because it's just hard for me to see. So some people, oh, and uh, someone had mentioned when you want to rename a variable, please don't do it by hand. Like you can go and say, hey, this is, if I didn't want to call it row, if I wanted to call that I, I have to go change it everywhere. And then it turns into red lines. You can just right click and say rename and say I, and it's gonna rename it everywhere. It says, hey, this is all the places I found your variable. Do you wanna change them all? And I say, yeah, put them all as I. And then column, they would do J. And this is just garbage you find online. And now I'm old and don't see well, so now my eyes look a lot like J's because they look basically the same except for like a little bit at the bottom. And I look at this and I get confused really easy. I'm like, well, what, what, what's an I, what's a J? So a lot of things you'll find online have I's and J's because people are dumb. Like, hey, look, I had to do less typing. Like, you don't win a prize for less typing, right? You, you you want your code to be readable. So use something nice. If you want to call it rows and columns, great. If you want to call it something else, that's fine too. Right? Just something that's useful here to spit those out. Does that make sense? Right? And then if you wanted to do the other facing side, just for fun, um, we could do that one too. So that one has a number of spaces as well. So it has, so if we were to look at, say, it's just to do like size five, right? Come on, so we have one, two, three, four spaces and a star, and then three spaces and two stars, and then two spaces and three stars. I can't find the star character. One space and four stars, and then five stars, right? So the number of spaces is the size minus the row number, right? So when we're at row one, we have four spaces, a size five minus one. At this row, we have size five minus two, because we're at row two, we have three spaces, right? So you might see something where you get extra loops happening, and you can do that too. So we can say for int uh, space is one, space is less than. So now to calculate by size minus the row, we can do that. So space is gonna be less than size minus row, less than or equal to, space plus plus, we can see out of space. Right? And then we still do the same number of stars. So we just say, okay, here's my spaces and here's my stars. Right? So it can be based off of something that's gonna decrease. Right? We just have to figure out kind of what, what's, the, what's the logic here. And again, that's the hard part. That's what we're trying to figure out. How do we take a problem, break it down step by step by step by step into something simple that we can make the computer do, right? This is the hard part of coding, right? Making C++ understand it because they have the right number of curly braces. That's important, but that's not the hard part, right? Anyone can do that. Okay, so let's let's make sure they work. So let me run. I should get two size nine triangles if we did it right. Look at that. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. All right. Okay, so far? All right, and then we could just copy paste that diamond code in here for fun too. Um, so I can have the whole choice thing, why not? We'll grab it all here. We can grab it all. So we want, this was gonna be for triangle here. So if their choice, right? Instead of else if it was diamond, else if my choice is equal to right triangle, right triangle, there we go. Let's do that thing. 
Um, I just cut and paste, sorry, I'm using all my keyboard shortcuts. Uh, I do those all the time. I found a really cool tool that showed what I was typing, like when I did keyboard shortcuts places, and then I didn't realize it also showed regular characters, so it showed my password when I logged into a website. <laughs> and I was, it was real, real bad, real bad, so um, I gave up on that. But sometimes the keyboard shortcuts are fun, so if it looks like I'm doing magic, just holler at me. I'll, I'll tell you what those shortcuts are. Okay, so again, ask them for their choice. We're defaulting here to five for fun. Um, and then eventually you'll ask what shape you want or um, you should have some sort of menu in here, right? So do the menu somewhere in here. Uh, this is my throwaway value, throwaway starter value. Ask the user to pick shape. And I guess we should probably ask them up there then, right? And then if they want more, I don't know, uh, sure. That sort of thing. Okay. And all of this happens as long as you don't want to quit. Right. What is wrong with my sugar right now? Yeah, it's fine. All right. I had donuts for breakfast. It was a really bad choice for breakfast. Um, they weren't even that good. It's really disappointing. Gas station donuts, sometimes a real hit or miss. Um, today was a miss, so I'm, I'm a little bummed. But the coffee, uh, <clears throat> the coffee was extra caffeinated, apparently. That was kind of exciting. So I'll let you know how I feel by the end of this. Um, probably not much stronger than I'm used to, so it should be okay. All right, any other thoughts, questions with the lab? Again, we've got till next week to turn it in. Um, ideally, you walk out of there, we're done. I know it's a little weird because we like we have class and then we have a break and then we have lab right away. You don't have a lot of time to process it, but it's our chance to practice. I'm gonna try going over them on Wednesdays because the content's just gonna keep on moving. Right? So we wanna like stay with it each week here. Make sure it feels good by the time we start the new stuff the next week. So if loops don't feel good now, that's okay. But by next week, you want them to feel pretty solid here. You want to feel pretty good with loops because we're moving on to the next thing. And the next thing is going to build on that and use, we're going to keep on using loops here on out as we go, right? So we're moving right into functions next week on 10 two. Okay, so it's okay if it's not solid yet. Do some more practice, right? Get into the Zybook, start doing the Zylabs. Has anyone been doing the Zylabs? A couple people? They're, they're awful, right? But it's good practice? Okay. All right. I'm, I'm going to keep telling myself that. If it, like, is only awful and doesn't feel useful at all, let me know. But best I can tell, most people say it's, it's relatively useful. Um, and then, like, it checks you itself, which is cool. So you know if you did it right or wrong every time. Okay? All right. Awesome. So let's get back into... Uh, how far did we get here? Oh, that's 1501. Love how they just added the number here. That's that's awesome. So let me go open my recent project here. Uh, so where did we go? Close that one. All right, I thought I had a recent list. That's fine. Well, this was chapter four. So we got through nested loops. So we're going to look at this break and continue and enums and variable scope. And then we pretty much have finished off chapter four, which is pretty good. So break and continue are special keywords. I'm not fond of them at all because they confuse me. That, that's entirely why I don't like them. That's all. So normally a loop will run from start to finish, right? Whether it's a while loop or a for loop, it just does what it does until the condition is no longer true. With for loops, we basically control that. Now you don't have to, right? You can use a for loop in place of a while loop, but it gets really confusing because why would you want it to look like that? So we could write this right here. We could say four. And remember, technically they're all optional. So you can just put the test in here, number not equal zero here. But no one does this. Please, please don't do this, right? right that, that's just awful, right? If you just want some condition, just use a while loop, right? Technically, you can do this, but people are going to look at you like you're crazy. So, like, don't. Okay? But, so you can always replace them here. Most of the time, we use the for loops if we know how many times we want it to run. Right? I'm going to start it at something. I'm going to go up until something, some case here, and I'll probably just add one. Right? You could, you could add two. You could, you know, you, you can do crazy things in that update section. So, if you want to just count odd numbers, right? For int odd is one. Odd is less than, I don't know, let's do like 20 odd plus equals 2. You can do that. Right? It doesn't have to be plus plus. Right? You, you can do any sort of update you want here. That's okay. 
right? Um, you don't often see that, right? If it's not just a add one to it, a lot of times people will opt for the while loop because this just looks weird. I don't know, because it's almost always a plus plus for for loops, but it doesn't have to be. Sometimes you could do minus minus, right? You could also count down, right? We could just see out the odd number and then an end line. Right? If you wanted to count down for int, you know, I don't know, start is 10, start is greater than zero, or minus minus, right? You could decrease, you could decrement here instead of increment. Sure. You can see out the start. Uh, and then line. Stat, start. There we go. All right. But these loops, like, they start and then they finish normally here. If you want them to do different things, we can use break and continue. So we'll look at break first because that one's easiest here. So some people will like to use break because what break does is it breaks the loop. It stops the loop from running and says, nope, just go to the end. You're done. So sometimes that's useful, and some people like that as sort of a style here. So if we did that sort of menu here, right, we can say, hey, you know, enter one for this, two for this, three for quit, something like that. And then we can get their input, input, C in the input. And then we could say while my, well, really, we could just say while true, which is, again, I, I don't like these here. This is ugly to Eric, right? And then if my input is equal to one, I do this. Else if my input is equal to two, I do that. And then else if my input is equal to three, I can break, use the break keyword. Um, isn't that an int? Oh, oh, do I already have an input somewhere? Input, input, do it, what? Did I already do that? Uh, bad, ugly input. Let's try that, just use another word here. Okay. Ugly loop input, there we go. So this one I couldn't just rename because I think I already had something named input up here somewhere above. I'm sure it's in here somewhere. Um, it was upset. So I'm just double clicking to highlight the entire word. You can double click to highlight a whole word. And what's nice is when you do this camel casing, it's all one word because there's no spaces. Like a double, double click will highlight it real quick and then I can paste, paste, paste on top here. All right. Now I don't get the red line. So you can use break here. This stops the loop. Some people like this. I'm not fond of this form at all because I would just rather say as long as the input is not three, keep on running, right? I, so this sort of hides the condition that ends the loop. When you say while true, you have to go find later in the code what will stop the loop versus if you put the condition here while input's not three, you know right at the top what will stop the loop. That's all. So it makes you have to go look harder, I feel like. Generally, you want to like, be able to understand what the code's doing at a glance. And this makes me work harder, and I, I don't like that. right? So, But you can. This is one option. So break will just end your loop immediately. So it just causes it all to jump all the way down to the end of the loop and stops. here. So you'll see breaks occasionally. Some people really like them. Um, again, I'm not fond of them, but it doesn't mean they're wrong. It's just a style preference at this point, really. Like it Functionally, it will do the same thing here. Um, some people like it because it saves you a little bit of, you don't have to have everything nested necessarily. Um, so we can get their input here, right? Um, let's go get their input again. So I could really quick, just at the top check here, hey, if my ugly input is equal to three, break. So putting it up top here then means nothing else has to have else ifs. Is if it breaks, the loop's done, right? Nothing else has to be tabbed in more or anything deal like that. So some people like it stylistically for that. So it ends the loop immediately. Immediately? That probably spelled right. So that's just an option, okay? Um, the other keyword you can use is continue. Continue causes the loop to jump back to the top. So stop running the rest of the loop here, jump back to the top and do something. So you can 
there's a lot of specialty use cases for it here. Uh, I think some of the like the easy examples here, we could say for int number is one, number is less than 10, number plus plus. If I only wanted to print out odd numbers here, I'd say, hey, if my number mod two is equal to zero, continue. Continue causes it, causes the loop to stop running and jump back to the top. All right, that's ugly. Hang on, where is it? I should go over here. Sure. So if it's even, it just jumps back up to the top, which will update and then test. Otherwise, I can see out number in that line. So you can do that. You can use it to not run the rest of your code. There's some fun cases for it. The book has a couple examples for it. Um, again, it to me, it just makes it harder to read. Like, just put that in an if and an else. Is, it would be my preference rather than like skip your whole loop here. But um, some people get weird about indentations. So, um, so basically anything that's here we can do functionally otherwise, but it's just a shortcut for people. Right? So instead of having to, to have it inside of a check and then have everything else outside that check, right, we can just use the shortcut. So generally I like shortcuts, but I feel like these make things hard to read. That's my bias against them is all. All right, so let's break and continue. Yeah, I think they've got more examples. Ooh, the breakfast meal finder here. Sure. So you want to spend your exact amount of money? Okay, sure. Why not? And then not have any change left over. Just keeps on going until it breaks. Sure. Like, you can. You can also write your loops differently, is all. All right, uh, continue. Sure. I thought they had more examples. Okay, they've got one, a little Simon pattern to see if we can get Simon Says is right. Sure. All right, um, variable name scope. So this is really fun. So as we've been defining variable names, notice I've got this number here. I think I have number a couple times. I got number here, right? I think, do I even have it up here? I might even have it up here. I use number a lot because I like number. Have any other numbers? Oh, I have a number to guess. Okay, so I, use, I have number twice, right? Generally, you can't do that, right? So I have a numbers here, and then down below I have number again, and it's not yelling at me. Usually, if we had that in our code, we said, hey, I want an int for number equals 10, it's gonna get upset with us, right? Where's number equals 11? Can we get mad at this? Ah, uh -huh, there we go. So there's some build errors. Eventually, you get number redefinition, multiple initialization. It's not the most helpful error here, but it's saying, hey, you're trying to redefine number. You're trying to initialize it again, give it a value, right? You declare it, and then you give it a value, initialize it. It says you can't do that. You already told C++ you wanted this thing called number. Not allowed to do that. So you can't have duplicates here but you can in another scope. So scope is our technical term for these curly braces. Right? When we create a block of code with curly braces, <clears throat> everything has scope. So they're scoped to that block. So everything declared inside this set of curly braces here for main is scoped to main. So you can see it in main and you can see it inside of further scopes in main. Right, so when I have another set of curly braces, I can still use this variable number because it was declared at the higher scope. So we had number, we're using another number guessing game everywhere here. Where's number again? Number, right? We can use it inside of this while loop scope because this is part of main, right? Sort of like this hierarchy. Here's the big bucket. You can put smaller buckets inside of those buckets. So what you're allowed to do is you're allowed to have a repeated variable in a different scope. Now it gets confusing though. So inside another uh, scope here, I can say, uh, let's do a while, um, we'll do a for loop. So for int, uh, I don't know, countdown is 10, countdown is less than, I don't know, as long as we're greater than zero. Oh, that was weird. Zero. I was looking for the key and I had no idea where it actually was on the keyboard. 
Come down, minus, minus. So inside of this scope, I can make a new variable called number. And so we'll start at this countdown. And I can see out the number and an end line. This is a local variable here. So I can have a new variable called number inside of this scope of the for loop here, and C++ is fine with that. It's going to run. So at every scope, you can define variables. So in a, in a smaller scope here, I have a new variable called number. The problem is now I don't have access to the previous variable number in the scope of main. Right? If I told C++, hey, I want this thing called number inside of here, it's like, okay, sure. Every time I use number now, I'm getting this one. So when C++ goes to resolve these variables, right, we, our variable just says, hey, C++, hold on to this for me. Right? And every time we use it, we say, hey, C++, give me the thing you're holding. Right? Hey, hold on to this integer somewhere in memory. I don't care where it is. And every time I want that value, I'm going to say, here's the name of it. Go find it. So as it resolves these variables, it says, okay, let me look in the scope you're in. Let me find the, the variable called number in this scope here. If it finds one, it gives it to you. If it doesn't, then it looks at the next bigger scope and the next bigger scope and the next bigger scope until it, there is nothing left, right? It's going to try and find variables from the, the current bucket to get bigger and bigger and bigger. See, so where are these things? So we're, uh, the technical term here is shadowing. We're shadowing the variable number in the outer scope by making a new variable in this scope here. It's not the end of the world. Um, sometimes it gets weird though, right? especially if we're not paying enough attention and we really wanted that value from outside, it can hurt us. And it's, it's a little a bit of a bummer that's not even warning us, hey, you already have this thing called number here. But that's okay, it's not the end of the world. Right? We, uh, we have number, scout, number, the variable from the main scope and that line still said it's a local variable so it's local to the main scope is all um, it's a little funny yeah, the, the block right block of code here um, the other fun thing right because scopes work from the larger bucket to the smaller bucket. If you create something in the small bucket, you can't use it in the larger bucket. So if we also wanted to make a number in here, int um, another number, number inside, I don't know, we'll say it's 10. Sure, we're gonna do this 10 times, it doesn't matter. But after this curly brace is done, after we leave this scope here, this another number, isn't accessible. It doesn't exist. C++ has no idea where this thing is. Remember, because when it goes to resolve variables, it looks in the current scope. And then it looks in the bigger scope and the bigger scope and the bigger scope. So if you make something specific to this loop, the scope of this loop here, when this loop is done, it's no longer accessible because you can only find it when you're inside this loop because that's where it's looking when it finds when it's looking in that scope for that variable. So you can't find a variable created inside um, another scope. I don't know if that makes sense, uh, the, the wording here, right? If, if you create it somewhere else, you can't use it outside now because it's local to this for loop. So behind the scenes, eventually, we're not going to use this memory anymore and we can give it back to C++ or give it back to the operating system. We'll get to that later. It's the whole garbage collection process is really fun. Um, but we can't use it. So if you want a variable to be set inside a loop, you have to create it outside the loop, use it inside the loop, and then use it when the loop is done. Right? If I declare it at the scope of main, I can use it inside my for loop, and then I can use it when the for loop's done. If I only declare it inside the for loop, I only have access to it inside the for loop. Because that's where it was declared. That's the scope of that variable is where it was declared. So I'll leave that one commented out here because that just won't run for us here. All right. One more, one more. And then I think we're in pretty good shape. So enumerations are really fun. 
So I like having constants for things. Turns out enums are even better than constants, depending on what we're doing, right? So constants are great for like, here's an input, here's a specific thing. So this is an enumeration. So something you can enumerate. Here's a like a list of something. Here's a bunch of different things that I might be picking from. In this case, it's the light state. The light is red, the light is green, the light is yellow, or the light is done. I don't know what a done state is, but sure, why not? Now, I, their names here are awkward, but that's okay. Uh, it's not the end of the world. So we're going to make a new variable of the type of enum here. So we're telling C++, hey, I want this thing that is an enum. And then later, we use the name of it. So it gets, it gets to be a little awkward. We can do this. So if we wanted to have a list of possible choices here, right? We could have this list here. So I could say, hey, I want an enum, and I want to call this my, um, oh, how about my colors? And then I give it a set of curly braces, which is kind of some weird syntax, but that's okay. So inside the curly braces, I just give it variable names for what are the options for colors. So we can have red, we can have uh, orange, we can have yellow, we can have green, we can have blue, we can have purple, because I can't spell violet or indigo. That's okay. Um, purple is good enough. Okay, so these are the possible color choices, the enumeration. These are the whole list of color options I'm giving you. Right? The only ones we can work with. Then if I want a variable that holds a particular color, one of these particular color, you know, oh, sorry, that should just be colors here. Um, just a, so capital is the convention for these. Because um, it looks like a type, we'll get to that later. It's not gonna make a whole lot of sense, but that's okay. So now I can say, hey, I want, and maybe this is just color, that's fine. How about color, um, my color? Sure, we can do that. So I'll say, hey, save me a place to store a particular color enum. I'm going to call that variable for the one I'm holding on to, my color. And then maybe we'll have color for your color. Color, your color. Can't type at all. Okay. And then I can start assigning values to them here, just like you would assign ints and floats and strings and things. But what you're going to assign is the enum type here. So we can ask the user, I, I know my favorite color, so I'm gonna say my color is equal to blue. I just give it the blue. So it looks like it's a constant here. Right? We kind of give it those constant types um, where they're all uppercase. But if you hover over it, it gives me a clue here. It says, hey, this is an enum color colon colon blue. So it's the enum of type color it's blue, and you can see it actually says it equals four. So behind the scenes, C++ assigns these things integer values, essentially. That's how it tracks, right? Because everything has to be stored as bits and bytes eventually. So it needs a, some way to store it. So it's going to just assign them integer values. Um, I think it's smart and it actually uses something smaller than ints. It probably uses the, the shorts or something like that, but I, I forget. It's not that important. So like if you hover over red, it's zero. Yellow's, orange is one, yellow's two, green is three, blue's four, purple's five. Right? It's giving them values behind the scenes, but I don't have to go say, hey, red equals one, orange equals two, yellow equals three. I can just say, hey, it's blue. Right? The, the conversion for numbers happens behind the scenes for me. I don't have to worry about it here. Okay? And then I can ask the user, hey, what's your favorite color? Is your favorite color? And then we can get, uh, how about we use a string, right, for color? And then we can see in for string or for color. And then if my color is equal to red, we'll say your color is equal to red. Sure. Again, dealing with all sorts of string input, we got other, other sorts of issues here. But then eventually I can now say, hey, if your color is equal to my color, see how we have the same favorite. Or if it's not equal to, right, I could say, hey, we don't have the same favorite color. we got choices, but you can compare enums now directly. But neither of these are, they're not really look integers, they're not really strings, right? We, we have assigned them specific values here based on what their options can be. So it gives you a way to, here's the list of possible things. I'm enumerating a list of choices. And we can use them here. So they like having 
hey, what's going on with the light here? Sure. If it's green, right? Sure. Eventually it'll go to the next one and becomes yellow. If it's yellow, the next one is red. If it's red, the next one is green. If it's quit, then it's done and they're done with their program because they want to, as long as they're not done, they want to keep going red, yellow, green, red, yellow, green, red, red yellow, green. No, that's backwards. Green, yellow, red. Wow. I know how traffic lights work. I promise. This is why we need self-driving cars, right? I know I can drive better than all the other idiots on the road, but I don't trust anyone else on the road. Right? Okay. Um, all right. Uh, so some enums. Enums are a lot of fun. They give you some cool options um, for storing values, working with values. Uh, this is the accepted coin types. Sure. I mean, it's, it's mostly just a shortcut for us. So I don't have to deal with creating a bunch of different constants and then being confused about constants um, as well. So they're a lot of fun. I think we'll use these. In, uh, maybe we don't. Next class, for sure. In uh, 200, uh, you'll use enums for sure in a project. Or you used to, at least. You probably will. Um, so just a way to store things to give us some shortcuts. How are you feeling so far? It's a lot of stuff in Chapter 4. It's a lot of stuff. And just wait, Chapter 5 gets even bigger which is fun. We start getting even more fun stuff. Okay so far? All right, there's not too much more with loops then. Uh, we spent a lot of time on loops, right? Chapter, project one is all about loops, right? A lot of loops, a lot of input, a lot of FL stuff. Right? It's just gonna keep, keep on building. Um, that's due on 10.4, right? 10.4, 11 a.m., 11.05 or so, right? Um, I'll go over the solution. So we've got a week left to finish that one. Start it if you haven't already. Okay. Ask me questions if you got questions. We've got the tutor available in the Engineering Success Center or something like that. I think I posted the announcement about that. Did you all see that? You didn't turn off announcements, did you? Some people turn them off because you get so many emails. Um, yeah, we got a tutor. So just walk-ins, right, which is awesome. So Mondays are a little rough. Like after our class, you could go for a little while on Mondays. Tuesday through Friday, there all the time, all afternoon. So hopefully one of those days at least it might work for you. Um, and it's free for students. So free is technically the wrong word here, right? It, it's no additional charge, but it's paid for by your tuition dollars and tax dollars that the state of Michigan gives you about, right? So someone's paying for it, but you don't have to, right? Is that, so is that a little more accurate than free? Okay, he, he doesn't volunteer for this. <laughs> um, and Andrew's a good guy, so he'll help you get you unstuck. He's not going to solve your projects for you, but he'll get you unstuck, get you pointing in the right direction, help you figure out why things aren't working right for you. Okay. Um, again, we're using the GitHub process. So it's a little rough last time. That's okay. I was working with you. Um, I did go through and score everyone who didn't turn it into Canvas a zero. Sometimes people just commit to GitHub and they're like, oh, you got it now, which I have access to it. But remember, GitHub and Canvas aren't linked. So you have to take the URL from Canvas and give it, oh, I'm sorry, the URL from GitHub and give it to Canvas so that Canvas tells me you turned it in. Yeah. You still can, it's fine. So everything is timestamped in GitHub. So when you commit things, it's timestamped in GitHub. So I can go, let's look at the, let's look at the main repository here. So 150, so here's more loops. And push, you know, I view this on GitHub. And I want to go look at, hey, here's the chapter, let's look at the chapter three file, right? So chapter three, I come in here, here's the chapter three CPP file. It shows me two weeks ago, this file was changed September 13th at 12.51 PM. I know the last time this file changed. That's one of the other good things source control tools do for us. You see the last time it was changed. So as long as you got it to GitHub on time, that's great. I'll, I'll, it's, we'll figure it out, okay? So you can go turn it into Canvas if you haven't yet, I'll rescore it. Um, everyone else I'm gonna to get to later this week, um, now I'm finally starting to feel a little better. Um, I can get scored, get those ones scored for you. Um, for project one, um, ideally you can score yourself, right? Kind of do a self-assessment. I've, I've gave you the rubric here. So include the self-assessment using the rubric in the readme. So however you want to do that, you can just say, hey, here's this item. I got two points. This item, I got two points. If you take a screenshot of it, that works pretty well too. You can take a screenshot of the rubric, that little screen snip. And then, I don't know, throw it in paint or something silly. Doesn't really matter. Come on, paint. And paste in your screenshot. 
and then you can just draw on it, right? You say, hey, I got two points, I got two points, I got two points, I got two points. I only got one point on this one here. Uh, however you want to do it, right? Whatever works for you, fantastic. The, the idea is you're assessing yourself, right? So that you know how you did. Most of the time, your self-assessment scores are really good, and I just take them because you folks are pretty good at this. Occasionally, people are like, oh, I did everything perfect, and they like only got half the stuff done, and it doesn't really work, and it's buggy, and I get really confused. So I'm like, no, you didn't. Uh, most of the time, people are pretty good at this sort of thing. So um, do the self-assessment, and then you just copy-paste that into the README as well. Right? Screenshots of it running, screenshot of your assessment, so I can go to the repository, I can look at it, give it a quick look, let's see if it looks good or not. So um, let's make sure we do that for project one. I don't think we were able to do that for project zero. I might have asked for it, but it's okay. We're, we're still figuring it out, right? So go ahead and grab those screenshots, right? Copy-paste them into the README file. It works really nice, really easy, and then everything's on the web. Um, and I don't have to deal with file attachments in Canvas or emails and um, or other things like that. So, um, oh, and then I did have like a little example of this running. Um, let me grab, go here. I think it's in this one. I put it in my other class. So I'm, I'm using this for another class as well here. So here's one example of what it might look like when it's running. Let's, let's throw another notepad here, because why not? Right? So it starts off, hey, you're 10 distance from the surface. Your X tilt is this, your Y tilt is this. Please enter a command. I entered help. You can't do that. Please enter. Here's your list of commands, right? The valid commands you can do. Again, any sort of input's fine. I liked using strings for this one. You don't have to use strings for this one. You can do the number menu. Any menu's fine, right? Okay, so, and again, it repeats. So this way you know what your tilts are. It makes it a little easier to land if you know if, if you're off center. It's really hard to land without crashing if you have no idea what that is. So then I gave it some other garbage. You can't do that, right? All right, I did nothing, right? My distance went down, my tilts didn't change. All right, X plus, so it changed from negative eight to negative seven. X plus, negative six, Y plus, now I'm at negative eight here. Please enter a command, uh, thrusters. So my distance went from six to seven with the thrusters. Sure, X plus, and then nothing's, and eventually I crashed. Hey, I crashed the lunar lander. Do you wanna play again, Y or N? A very exciting game. My kids love this one. No, they don't. Uh, like, where's all the pictures, Dad? I thought you could make computers do things. I'm like, well, pictures are hard. So, um, yeah, eventually. Just a, a plug for in your heads later. I, I know advising is going to come talk to you and tell you you should probably register for winter classes. Um, at some point, you probably have a choice of a language elective. You can take Java. You can take C, uh, C Sharp. You can take Python. The C Sharp class is part of the game design track. Generally, I teach that one. Um, it's not guaranteed because I'm a lecturer, but generally I teach that one. And we build a game that runs on Xbox. Uh, Xbox Ones, they're not like the latest and greatest, but we don't need the fancy graphics anyway because we're basically building Atari games, just little 2D platformer games or like even simpler than that. Um, we do some fun stuff there. Those have graphics. Eventually, we get there to graphics. Um, you don't touch graphics for quite a while, though, in, like with C++, which is sad. Nothing in this class is graphical. Nothing in, in 200 is graphical. Nothing in 350 is graphical. Eventually, we'll get to fun, pretty things that have, like, buttons you can click on and, and all sorts of good stuff there. So we'll get there. Uh, so that's my plug for eventually, if you want to see me again, um, the C-sharp class is a lot of fun. Uh, yeah. Generally not, no. So I, I do this, I do the 150, 200s, and I do 150, or 1501 and 2001 for Python for data science. Um, and I'll do the C-sharp class. Um, and then, you know, that's about it. So, all right. This this helped to see kind of what that output might, and again, this is just what it might look like. It does not have to look like this. Right? You're, you're welcome to take your menus and outputs and displays any, any way you want, whatever makes sense to you. Um, I'm pretty flexible. Is, uh, human computer interaction or user experience, this UX idea is not a, something I'm very talented with. That's okay, right? I'm, I'm going to stay in my lane and focus on the things I, I know how to do. Um, you can get a whole master's degree in human computer interaction and learn how to like make menus that work well for people and those sorts of things, which are fantastic. I'm glad people do that because otherwise we get garbage programs. Like, I don't know how to use this thing. So uh, if you've ever spent any bit of time looking at AutoCAD, or any like drafting software, those things are nuts. Like there's a gazillion things you can do. I don't know how you design a menu that's easy. That's why they've got like special mice that have 13 keys on them and track balls and all sorts of fun things. So um, humans are hard and computer interaction stuff is hard. So 
we'll get there. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, oh, I did see. I don't know if I shared that. That was a really cool one. Someone, um, what was it? They they are able to play games now with um, like neural links. Someone was testing out stream. Hang on, streamer. I just saw. Yeah, 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 yeah. So this person here. I don't know who this person is. She's got some sort of setup here that's detecting thoughts, and she rigged that into the keyboard bindings. I was able to beat. Oh, there's so many ads on this, this site blows here. Wow. I don't have ad block on. Someone at one point was like, hey, that's sort of like stealing because that's how your websites make money and they give away content for free. And I was like, oh, I don't want the ads though. But so anyway, um, so yes. Yeah, so, so eye tracking plus the uh, thoughts here, thought tracking here. Which is pretty cool. Um, so I don't know. It was neat. So eventually, maybe we can do things that don't require all sorts of crazy key bindings, and we can just think at our computers. But um, we'll get there eventually. I know Neuralink is just going through FDA of testing. They, they got their approval now to do some testing for patients with ALS or patients who are paralyzed. You can send brain signals to your nerves even if there's no connection there, which is crazy cool. That sort of stuff is amazing. So uh, brains are neat. They're really neat. Yeah, this was just January. Okay. This was a couple months ago, but still this year. That was a weird rabbit hole. Sorry. All right. Any other thoughts, questions, concerns? All right. Sounds good. I will see you folks next Monday then. Have a good one.